And joining us now for his second of five consecutive days here on the agenda, Mike Harris, Premier of Ontario from 1995 to 2002 and the MPP for Nipissing Riding up in northern Ontario for almost 20 years. Uh, nice to see you again, Mr. Harris. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. Well, people may remember you as Premier, uh, I suspect, but what they may not remember is that you didn't just sort of show up and get that job. You actually were in public life from 1981, and you were the leader of the third place party going into two elections, 1990 and 1995, when you only had a, uh, a small hardy band, I guess, of about 20 when you first got in. So let's start there. What are the keys, as we look uh, across the uh, week at issues of leadership, what are the keys to leading a party when there's only 20 of you, and you know that probably half of them think that they can do a better job of, <laughs> at leading than you can? Yeah, it, it was an interesting challenge. Um, we had been decimated as a party uh, back in the in the uh, uh, in the '87 election, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when we we really did a lot of introspection, if you like. We had time because we had this uh, huge majority government led by by David Peterson. We knew we 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 thought we knew we had four or five years. Uh, what actually happened is, you know, we can talk about when we get to it. But the, uh, at the time, we had interim leader, and, and I, I was instrumental at that time uh, under Andy Brandt in being part of the team that, that revamped our whole constitution. Andy was the interim leader. Uh, Andy Brandt was, it was the interim leader. And there were, there were a team of us, uh, uh, Tony Clement and a number of, of, of party people, that uh, believed the old power politics of the past, it was time to, to revamp it. We had some examples with the Reform Party. Um, I think maybe the, it might have been the PQ in Quebec that, that uh, went one member, one vote. And, yeah. and, uh, for picking a leader. Uh, for picking a leader. We were kind of the first mainstream party, at least in, in, uh, uh, in the East. And, and uh, we went one member, one vote. Uh, we uh, got rid of that backroom politics, so, you know, Senator Norm Atkins' vote was the same as the guy that just signed up two <laughs> weeks ago. Uh, he always used to, you know, express it that way, and I think that was that was an important part of what gave us the offer, you know, the opportunity. Um, so what? Uh, th then when we did have have the leadership, it was under this process, and uh, it was just at the end of the day, it was just Diane Cunningham and I. We were both new. All the old loyalties disappeared. It's a great lesson in this, by the way, for the for the Cretchen and Martinites, because uh, you know they're still there. You know mm -hmm. the old Cretchen people, the Martin people. They didn't like one another. They fought. Uh, then one became Ray supporters. One ignited. They're still fighting. Uh, they'll never be in government, by the way, until they get rid of all that and they go to the next generation. And everybody has to pick pick somebody new. That's that's my prediction. Uh, that was your experience, it, and that was my experience. Because you had we, two new we, leaders. We, 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 we had two new leaders. We were the next generation of leader, if you like, and and uh, so the old, you know, the old uh, uh, McMurtry people, or you know, and the old Timbrel people, they all they all came together under this leadership. And then Diane Cunningham came. Both of us campaigned. I think in such a way, it was very easy for us to come together. That was that was the number one key. We had, uh, you know, how was I able to function? In, in those early years. Then uh, David Peterson called a snap election right after my leadership. We had no money. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, we, but we set the agenda in that campaign. We knew we couldn't win the campaign. Uh, they didn't know who Mike Harris was. This they, was they, they, spring they, of 1990. This is the spring of 1990. And, and uh, so this was my early leadership days. So we set the agenda. We became the tax fighting team. We had the tax fighting buses and it was taxes and tax increases that really did in uh, David Peterson and I don't know if you recall uh, on the back of the bus about 10 days before the vote they could see what was happening uh, and they they uh, they offered to reduce the sales tax that they had just increased mm -hmm. uh, when they lost all credibility at that moment in time I was not ready to be leader the public didn't know who I was and Bob Ray came up the middle and became leader with you know 37 percent of the popular vote majority government yeah. but we set the agenda and i think the the, the the small band of caucus if you like said you know what we didn't lead harris wasn't ready he didn't do so good here this this or that but he deserves another shot he set the agenda in this campaign and uh i, I would say this this group of of party supporters because it was one member one vote they had the power the party members not the caucus 
on, on the leadership issue. But this small band of caucus, and we, be, we got four more seats or something at the time, uh, they, they uh, saw enough in me that they entrusted me with, with what we did over the next four years. Let me follow up on something you just said, because I think it's a, a real insight into where you were at the time. You said, Senator Norman Atkins' vote, Senator Atkins, member of the Big Blue Machine, been in the party for decades and decades, is worth as much at that convention as the person who joined two weeks right, ago. Right. And, and you were, I mean, you're not saying it, but it's true, you were not part of the PC party establishment. You weren't no. part of the Big Blue Machine. No, you I weren't wasn't. part of that long 42-year history. No. You were on the outside looking in. I was. So what leadership qualities did you have to bring to bear to not only you know, take over a party that had kind of let's face it, marginalized you in the past, yeah. and get to a point where they're now prepared to say, okay, yeah, you're the leader, and we accept that. How do you do that? Well, you, 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 it evolves, and uh, you, 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 I started winning over through the one member, one vote. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, after the, uh, you know, after I became leader, I'm, it's the same point, uh, and, and uh, in the buildup to the Common Sense Revolution, I was not uh, particularly still well accepted in Toronto, if you like, or amongst sure the establishment. Yeah. So you go to where you can, and you start building the base all across the province. Brian Mulroney did the same thing, by the way. Not particularly well accepted by the establishment when he took over. Yeah. Didn't come from the, particularly the establishment. In fact, he overthrew the establishment mm -hmm. uh, to become leader. He started traveling the country into all the small legion halls, all the small towns. And then, you know, the stories would start to build and you start to, 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 to build credibility. Uh, and out of that, all of a sudden, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of like a shock to, to the establishment when they see the amount of support that's there. Sort of like Rob Ford, by the way, if you want a current example. Toronto I'm Mayor's sure race. it was absolutely shocking to the Toronto Star <laughs> and the CBC and all the elites here in Toronto that figured they understood Toronto politics, Rob Ford. Uh, you know, now amongst the leaders, perhaps going to be the next mayor of Toronto. It came out of, they thought nowhere, but Rob Ford knew his constituency, knew who he was speaking for, and, and slowly built that credibility. You and I did an interview in the middle 90s that you will not remember, but I sure do, and it wasn't actually for anything you said in the middle of the interview. It was something you said before the camera started rolling. <laughs> As we were walking, it was freezing cold, I remember, and I was very bundled up, and you being from North Bay were not, and we were doing this outdoors in front of Queen's Park in the wintertime, and you just kind of let slip this line. You said, you know, the Dalton camps of the world never thought I could be premier of this province. Uh, but I did. <laughs> and, and, I, and in that last answer you just gave, I hear echoes of that still. You are still, I okay. think, not completely, your leadership style, whatever it was, is still not completely accepted by the so-called elites of this province, no, I is think, it? I think it's probably surprised them. I mean, it, it's not a secret that Dalton Camps and the Norman didn't support me. By the way, uh, Norm Atkins and, and Hugh Siegel and, and uh, folks that didn't support me or the leadership were very supportive afterwards, particularly, you know, Hugh Siegel and John Tory and, and those who, who because I, I, you know, I was the outsider running as leader. Um, and uh, they, they didn't relate to me, uh, I, I, I can say that. And the, the politics was changing, the one member, one vote, and, and the rest of it. But they were all supporters afterwards when, when we finally, they, they, you know, the Big Ten came. And, uh, you know, the, the other interesting thing is, I mean, it wasn't that, that I didn't know I had to win over Toronto and I had to win these people over. It had to be a very broad uh, coalition. Uh, it's just you start where you can, and you start building where you can, and you start building credibility where you can. And the other fact that very few people understand is, is that in 1995, when we built that coalition, uh, I won more seats in the 416, a higher percentage than I did outside of the 416. People today are shocked when I tell them that. You won seats in the 416, <laughs> I remember it well. Well, here was the biggest transition. When you eventually win that election in 1995, you're not the head of a caucus of 20 anymore. It's now 82. How, how does one wield leadership prowess when it's not just a hardy band of, you know, <laughs> men and women that all of whom yeah, you know reasonably yeah, well? Yeah. My, my bet is on election night there were some of those 82 who you probably didn't even know. No, it's true. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had read their names, I guess, or heard of them or campaigned with them, but I certainly didn't know a lot about them. And, and there, that two-week transition, getting ready, you know, when you've got to pick your cabinet, 
that, that was 24 hours. I mean, and, and, the, and the civil servants, who's going to lead the civil servants? Those, those were all the things we had to do. Those were 24-hour days. They were in many ways uh, much scarier than, if you like, in being an obvious scarier in the sense that, that you've got to assemble as much information as you can as quickly as you can, and you ultimately have to make those decisions. And uh, there's 82 people who probably all thought they should be in cabinet or deputy premier, or minister of finance, uh, whatever it is. The, uh, it's a great, a great credit, though, to that caucus that when I did make the decisions, they all accepted them. And uh, it's not always the case, uh, but they all accepted them. What do you think? Those, I think because of the campaign, they, they had, we had built a great deal of credibility in the year leading up to the campaign and in the campaign, and they had a great deal of confidence in the whole team. You know, the, 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 the Tom Longs and the Leslie Nobles told all the candidates, this is what's going to happen, this will be the first week. Uh, we, did, we did unusual things in that campaign. We shared the whole thing with all the candidates, you all were, the campaign You were 25 managers. points behind when that campaign yeah, started, yeah, yeah, and we're yeah, we halfway were. through. Right, and we, and we were, and we told the candidates, A, we're going to win, here's how we're going to win, here's when the polls will move, here's when all, and all that unfolded. Um, as, as, you know, within a day or so of, of what we predicted. So there was a bit of magic, I think, there that a lot of people said, well, you know what, the, the, if, if Harris doesn't know what he's doing, this team knows what they're doing. But it was a collective thing. And uh, so I was given a, a, a period of grace. Those that didn't get in cabinet right away, uh, you know, I think took the attitude, well, by golly, I, I, I trust his leadership, and I'm going to earn it and deserve it and get in there later. Chris Stockwell did. Chris Stockwell no. went to your office and swore a blue streak in your face. Well, 81 out of 82. 81 out of 82, okay. <laughs> uh, when Johnny McDonald signed into a hotel once, they asked him his occupation, and he said, cabinet maker, which is pretty clever. Here's what Teddy Roosevelt said about it. He said, the best executive is the one who has sense enough to pick good men, today we would say good men and women, to do what he wants done and self-restraint enough to keep from meddling with them while they do it. Did you sign on to that? Yeah, I, th I think so, uh, pretty much. Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I would agree with, 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 those, with those sentiments. Pick them and, let them and then get out of the way, let them do their and, jobs? And get out of the road, let them do their jobs. I, I, in, in the early days, I suppose it was a little easier for me than my predecessors, again, because of the common sense revolution. Um, you had the road map. We had the road map. So the bureaucracy had the road map, the ministers had the road map, um, Guy Journal uh, had, was, was part of the team that prepared uh, the briefing books for all the ministers. Said, Your chief of staff. Yeah, yeah, well, he wasn't at the time, well, but he, well, yeah. he, he did become my chief mm -hmm. of staff. But he was key, you know, one of the key parts of, of, of the campaign team and part of David Lindsay was the chief of staff. Right. So between David and everybody, but Guy was, a, you know, at that time uh, w w was a big part of, of the detail. And every minister had binders said, here's, here's how the common sense revolution pertains to uh, you know, social services to education to to uh, all of the, to finance. Well, what, so, what happened so in that made it a little bit easier. What happened in cabinet though, when a minister would say, "This wasn't covered in the common sense revolution. It's just come up, and I don't agree with the way you want to handle it." Yeah, no, that's where we had great discussions and great debates, an and we had like consultations. What? Well, I mean, the the. Uh, uh, amalgamations of, of, of municipalities. That wasn't in the common sense revolution. We said, we, you know, you're going to do, you got to figure out how to do more for less, right? We can't keep spending this amount of money and we want quality services. So how are we going to do that? And, and uh, one of the ways we looked at was, was uh, you know, municipalities. We also asked municipalities uh, to take an across the board 3% cut. Uh, in, in, in our transfer payments to the municipalities. You know, a little less than downloaded on us by the feds, but we said, you know, everybody's got to be part of this. And I will say this, for the most part, municipalities said, we get it. No point having a booming Toronto in a bankrupt province. And it, just like I said to Paul Martin, we support the cuts. No point having a booming province in a bankrupt Canada. So we had, and in fact, you know, that first uh, AMO conference, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, when I laid out the plan, told them what they, you know, the, the, the reduction, I got a standing ovation. They said, all right, you know, we're part of it. We, we understand. And that, that's part of leadership, too, by the way, is saying, here's where we're going to be. We're here, you know, we're 10th and last in so many categories here in Ontario. We got this deficit. We can go to here. 
But here's what we have to do to get there. And so municipalities were our partners. Now, when we came to amalgamation, uh, many municipalities were our partners. Many were not. I mean, if, and it, I think you know. Well, uh, Toronto was that, opposed. That you know Hamilton that, was opposed. well, there would be no city of Toronto mm -hmm. if I had not uh, forced it. Uh, there would be no city of Toronto today. It would be a collection of these, you know, oddball municipalities. Hazel McKay never wanted to see of Toronto. She thought maybe Mississauga could take over, <laughs> and she might have been right, you know. But uh, I think we, it was the right thing to do. We needed uh, a strong uh, Toronto. Uh, if you want to be a world-class city, you had to be that size. Now, I don't agree with all the policies that followed. The council's probably too large, but that principle, uh, uh, you know, is there. So that was debated long and hard amongst our caucus and amongst, and amongst our cabinet. And when the Toronto members came to you and said, this is not how we do things in Toronto, which they did say, you then have to show leadership and what do you do? You have to find a consensus and once you make the decision, you, 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 you've got to go with it. I mean, we, we, we came up with these, these uh, uh, which, which would have come from some of the Toronto members, we came up with these, these local councils. Mm -hmm. We could have some of the decision making on stop signs, on little street lights, you know, things that affect everybody's lives, the speed bumps, all these little things. So we set those up. Um, uh, to be honest, there's twice as many councillors because, you know, the, the, the City of Toronto folks said, well, you know, my mayor's opposed and, and da 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 and there's going to be fewer politicians and, and, you know, we had led, by the way, too, announcing there'd be fewer of us <laughs> uh, after this. You know, 130, they wanted us to go to 150. We, we cut it back to, to 100 uh, MPPs as well. But uh, so we ended up, instead of a council of 26, we ended up with a council of 52, which I think was a huge mistake. But, you know, that was all part of the consensus to get, get the team on side. Gotcha. Okay, Mr. Harris, that's day two. We'll come back and do it again tomorrow and the next and the next. Looking forward to it.